we're going to make a report out of it. So the way we do that is with um, our markdown, which is just a flavor of markdown uh, that is specifically for R. And I will go into more detail on what exactly that means. So again, as um, every, I'm not sure why this skips, but yeah, as uh, every single one of these presentations have been, this is Creative Commons, so feel free to use it, remix it with attribution at any point in time in the future. Okay, so moving on, uh, what we'll be doing today is just uh, setting up a brand new R markdown file and then talking about the different ways that you can output reports. So we'll be making them in HTML and PDF by the end of tomorrow. Uh, then we'll talk about loading data into R Markdown, which is very similar to what you've already done, likewise with libraries. And then today we'll just finish off with how we actually take the code we wrote today and put it in an R Markdown format without any errors. And then that'll be it. So a nice, easy, I hope, rehashing of what we've done so far. Um, yeah, and again, feel free to ask questions at any point in time on the Slack and uh, either Greg or Lauren or myself will take a moment to answer them. Okay, so our markdown documents will let us convert all the analysis, like I've said before, into something that's nicely formatted. And I'll show you in a second what I actually mean um, as I'm saying that over and over again. So today we'll just go over a little bit of syntax. And then tomorrow you'll see that once we've kind of set up all the code in what I'm going to explain in a second are called R chunks. Um, there's actually very little left to do to make it nicely formatted and uh, human readable and even, you know, publishable down the line. So this is what is going to happen today. We're going to take a document from our markdown and I'll go over in a second how to generate that just within our studio. And then we're going to look at how to display it as a PDF and as an HTML document. Uh, and HTML documents, you know, are just really versatile. Just everything you see on the web eventually is rendered as HTML. Um, and so by creating that particular report uh, type, what you're able to do is you're then able to put it, you know, maybe on your lab's website, or um, you're able to uh, view it in like a little bit more computer friendly format than PDFs sometimes are. Um, and so it's just really great for any sort of like screen type interaction that you want to have with your reports down the line. And, you know, PDFs are also useful for all the other reasons that PDFs have been useful until now. Okay, so uh, knitting is just the technical term that I'm going to be repeating a lot. So I wanted to just clarify that I'm not saying anything particularly magic here. Uh, it just means that it renders a document. So it takes all the code and then knits it or you know, formats it and compiles it into the HTML and PDF views that you're looking at here. So when the button on your RStudio says knit to HTML, it'll open this HTML viewer, which you can then open in your browser with this button over here. And then it'll just show in Chrome or in Firefox, whatever tool you're using. And then if you knit to PDF, then it'll just save in the same directory as the directory that you're currently working in and show you this from markdown. And the text that's here, that's all auto-generated every time you create an R markdown file in RStudio. So it's nice because you never have to memorize any part of the structure that I'm presenting now. It's always just given to you as like a little, um, let's say like boost to your memory. So you remember how to format it. And the goal here really is to take analysis that you've already done and very easily convert it. And that's the intention with these kinds of documents. So if you know here, a few things we're going to learn by the end of tomorrow are things like how we can uh, make nicely head, nicely formatted headers, how we can add you know, the date of the publishing and our author name to reports. Um, you can see there's like all kinds of different fonts and, and styles. And also there's all kinds of different views for your code. So this is an output, for example, from um, the quark house function, I believe. And here is a plot um, that we've output. So you can really control in a fine grained way how something is seen um, in the end product. Okay, so we're going to take a second now, and this is going to be the only practical component for the next like probably 10 minutes or so, and I'm going to be just talking to you. 
uh, and we're just going to make an R markdown file. And this is what we're going to be working on uh, the rest of today and also tomorrow. So you're going to start by going up to your file um, dropdown over here in the top left corner, I believe, for most of your screens, at least. And then under new file, you'll see this R markdown option. And when you click on it, you'll see this dialog panel. So you can just call it whatever. I called it in my first markdown report. The author name should be pre-populated with your name, which just comes from your machine, I believe. And then you'll select, if it's not already selected, the HTML option, just because it's the most versatile. And uh, further down the line, we'll talk about how to render any format you want at any point in time. So you're not confined by the option that you select here right now. So I'm just going to demonstrate really quickly, and then we'll take a minute to do it on our own, just file, and then select the R markdown option. And then as I've shown you, um, I've already have something, uh, actually it's fine, I can name it. This doesn't have to be unique actually because all it will populate is this top section of your report. It won't actually name the file itself. So my first markdown report and then HTML is already selected and I go okay. This is what you'll see. So as I've shown you before, it already comes pre-populated with quite a bit of text. And we'll go over in a second exactly what each of these sections mean. So if you could all just um, press yes when you've done that and it works for you, and then we can move on. I think we've reached forum, I believe. If anybody's having any trouble, if you could just uh, do a quick type in the spot. Oh, okay, yes. Um, that's right. We didn't mention this before the break, which we had to vent to. Um, that's all right. I think I can keep lecturing and then uh, it should install the in packages on its own, but at minimum you'll need R Markdown and uh, Tiny Tech. Lauren, if you could just paste in the Slack the commands for that, just so that we don't lose too much time on it. Um, but for whoever's having trouble rendering the files or creating them, um, this is just what you'll run in the console, and then it will prepare it for you. Uh, I think the prompt it will automatically download the packages that you need. Uh, yeah. You need to specify them. That's what it did for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it should be a pretty painless process. Um, okay, so in order to actually knit or render this file, you'll go to this knit button up here, and that should be at the top of a specifically R Markdown file. Um, this button here will, well, it'll first prompt you to save this. So uh, we'll save it as, you know, test RMD one, for example, and then as it knits, it will open up this browser window and then you'll be able to see what this actually looks like. So as you can see, even like with pretty minimal playing around, it's already a nice presentation of information and code. And here I'll highlight again, there are several options. So Although you selected HTML when you created the file, you actually have the options here to switch between PDF and Word at will. And then um, as long as you have the packages like pre-installed in your machine, it will just render you know, without any further input from you. And then if you don't, it'll just prompt you first to install them and then you can continue. Okay, and then the document outline is one other thing I'll point out. On the top right corner, you'll have this little button with a bunch of lines on it that are supposed to be like lines of code. This will show you, depending on the headers that you've included, 
in your R Markdown file the outline of your document. So the same way that you see a document outline like in Google Docs, for example, this does the same thing. And this is just to ensure easy navigation through what can sometimes be a pretty lengthy file. Okay, so now we'll go through how to load data. And again, this is very similar to what we did before. Um, I'll kind of go through the anatomy of this first before we do that. But as you can see, the actual command, very similar to what we've done so far today. So the first thing that I'll talk about is this YAML header. And uh, YAML is an acronym, um, which is kind of has a, a fairly <laughs> not meaningful um, uh, meaning, which just says YAML ain't a markup language. Uh, it just basically means that this specifies the metadata. It's not a full language. It doesn't have like too many specifications it can actually let you do. It's just like a very structured set of rules that you can include at the top of your markdown file. And then it'll control the type of output. As we will later see, it'll also control whether you have a table of contents or pagination or references um, in your document. And so for now, you don't have to touch it. And today, we probably won't touch it again. Uh, uh, Gabby, a quick question. Does the date have a... Um... Does it have a, a, what about if you did year, month, day, instead of month, day, year? I believe it does nothing. Like it won't yell at you. We can okay. play around with this. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I believe it's um, just a string. It, it's just a string. It. Okay, perfect. Okay. Yeah. Sorry for the yeah. log. You can see you can kind of put in whatever you'd like in that. Uh, this part is pretty not finicky. And uh, generally speaking, if you accidentally make a mistake here and write a command that doesn't exist, it'll just um, it maybe give you a warning in the console, but it won't actually, very rarely will it actually stop you rendering a file, which you know is uh, both an, a problem sometimes, but sometimes it's just nice to not have to worry about. Okay, the next thing I'll talk about is just some more terminology. This section is called a code chunk. And anytime you see these three ticks followed by a curly brace and the letter R, that's a code chunk. So that means that just R code will go there. So any code from the analysis or plotting or loading data that we've done so far today will go into one of these by the end of today. And then the third is just this run button. So you can either you know, highlight all the code in a chunk and uh, press you know, command or control enter and run something, as you can see at the bottom here. Or you can just press this play button, and it'll do the exact same thing. And it'll just stop at the end of the code chunk, so the bottom three ticks. And as you can see from the highlighting in RStudio, it actually delineates quite nicely where your code chunk is and where the text is. And so what that means is like, you can actually just run your analysis straight in our markdown file. And then as you work through things, it'll just generate the report for you automatically. So quick chunking, just a little bit more detail on that. Um, it'll start with three ticks, the curly brace and the R, a really important detail. And we'll close with the three ticks here. Then aggregate data is just the name that I gave the code chunk. So code chunks uh, can't have spaces the same way variable names can't have spaces. And we just use them mostly to keep track of where we are and like to allow easy maintainability. There are more um, fancy ways that you can do things with R Markdown. For example, create a fully functional like multi-page website where the code chunks can then be reusable. Um, we won't go into that today or tomorrow, but they do have purpose beyond just um, being, you know, nice names. I like them just because, you know, I'm fairly um, compulsively organized. So, uh, and then number three is a nice way for us to organize how much output we actually include in our report. So with our markdown, we can actually control uh, which code chunks will show the console output. So all of the feedback that you get from running a function and which code chunks won't. So in what cases is this useful? In the case where you're loading, for example, just your data frame, you don't really want the 
output from the console for that, uh, because that's not really like interesting or meaningful information to the reader. In cases like, um, for example, the table functions or uh, plotting functions, you would want that output because that's what the function does. It creates output that is visual and informative. And so in that case, you would include true, uh, which I believe is also the default. So really, you only have to specify false when you don't want that output. So this is just um, more details on that. Echo false means that we won't see the code chunks themselves. So in cases where we're not really interested in showing the code, we would do echo false. In cases where we want to show the code, but we don't want to show the output of the code, we would use include equals false. Uh, and these are things that you kind of go back and reference again and again. So don't worry too much about memorizing them. But in cases where this is useful, it would be things like um, things that you want to run in the background. So again, loading data, maybe you don't want to show the name of the data frame that you're using. In that case, you would put it in a code chunk that is under the echo false command. And then you won't have to see it when you're rendering it. So an example of that um, would be here. And then when we knit the document, you'll note that echo false meant that the plotting command never showed up. All you saw was the plot itself. And so it just created like a nice clean visual of the image itself and then not much beyond that. So, um, which then sorry, sorry to interrupt you again. Um, the, pur the purpose of this document is to be open and to share what it is you did so that people can reproduce it, correct? Or to create um, something that's publication quality, or um, you can also move beyond PDFs and HTMLs and create actual PowerPoint slides. Um, yeah, but, um, that but, 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 but that said, but the, the purpose is to create something that will allow scientists to do reproducible science, right? And so maybe, I guess, so with respect to your last example, so I, I'm, I'm being facetious a little bit, but I'm an open science freak on this side. Right? It's, my, it's my day job. And, and so I guess to show how you're loading data and, and what the format of that data is, you, you could load dummy data, I guess, and show that. Mm -hmm. And then say for your data, it will be whatever your data is. I appreciate you don't want to show your data, but you want to show how you loaded data. Is, 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 so I guess, is that a include false sort of type statement? Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> so you won't see the output, but you'll see the code itself. And then sometimes when you're yeah. just writing, you know, just code that could be helpful. And, and, and then you can put a dummy file name in your in your document that you want to share. So as so as not to give away what your file name is in real life, for example. I yeah, that's work. Because even if it errors out, it wouldn't um it wouldn't actually be a concern because you would never see the output. No, we could no exactly, yeah. but so, you also you wanna you wanna show people how what it looks like with dummy data. And so, you know, I, I, let's just take an example. You're loading a, a SAM file. And so you mm -hmm. don't want to actually put the, the actual number of the SAM file you're putting into your example, but this is, right. you're, you want to load a SAM file and you want to see what a SAM file process through this workflow looks like. Yeah, right? I think in that case, it would really, yeah, so you could then kind of play around with a combination of these echo and include chunks. You would want to yeah. uh, include the code that shows the dummy data file, but then you'd yeah. want to suppress the put from every chunk that uses the real SAM file. Real data, yeah, 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 okay. Yeah. You could do a bunch of clever stuff with that. But like in a past life, for example, I did like a couple just reports that included visualizations uh, where the client themselves weren't particularly interested in the code that I used. They were just interested in like the, the takeaways. Um, yeah. So then that was a nice way to create something that's very readable, uh, but then like doesn't, yeah. you know, add too much overhead work um, beyond the actual R script. Yeah. So that's like, but a let's good say way to you're, 
Yeah, but let's say your client was a nasty reviewer of a scientific journal, of an open access scientific journal that wanted to see your our markdown project sort of file before he accepted the publication of a paper. Mm -hmm. And so you'd yeah. want to provide as much information that was open to this said reviewer and to the said readership of this publication. Presumably. For sure. Yeah, then you'd want to be yeah. clever about which code you're revealing. Yes. But for all nature hopefuls, this is what you should do. Yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. It's great. Yeah. Um, okay, so after oh, very nice. We're, we're making good time. Um, our first exercise, which is like the last thing that we'll do today, is we're just going to take all of the code from our um, previous ex uh, exercises with Lauren, and we're going to turn it into a functional R markdown file. So what do I actually mean by that? All I want is for there to be kind of like logical chunking of R commands in these R chunks, and I want it to run without error. So don't fuss too much about what code should be included or not included until you have that running. All we'll actually do is we're going to take, um, so this is the code from Lauren. What I'll do is, for example, I'll copy this. I'll, um, as you can see, actually, she has- Gabby, copy. can you copy code we ran? Because we didn't yes. run that. Or Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. So, yeah, um, there we go. So I'm going to copy, for example, this. What you're in, it just has the names, the dimensions, and structure of the example data to .txt file. And I'm going to just straight up erase all of the given code after this YAML header. I'm going to create a code chunk. So three ticks are uh, code chunk one. You can name it something more meaningful, but you know, just uh, for the sake of today, you can be quick and dirty about it. And you're going to put this in here. Comments will work the same way as they do in regular R. You can also paste them outside of the code chunk. And this will actually give you text that names you know, the code chunk in the actual report. And so if I have DF2, yeah. So one thing to note is that I have DF2 already loaded. If not, you'll want to run which all of you should, because we've all been here today, uh, you can just run this command as well. And then that will work the same way it does. Otherwise, you can test that before you need it. So, oh, this is, I think, in just like a different directory. So we can be more explicit about it. Over here. And then as you can see, it outputs a bunch of different stuff, which means that when it knits the file, it output the same thing. So if I knit it, you'll see the same thing that I pasted it in, um, just like in the R markdown format. And it'll look a bit messy today. Tomorrow, we're going to go through all the different fine tune controls that will make it very nice. And then at the very end, what it will look like is a very nice report with a bunch of different types of visualizations and tables and so on. So this, for example, is the PDF version of that. So a nice table of contents, a bunch of headers that are numbered so we can keep track of them very easily, a table that's like centered and captioned, and then results from all the different analyses that we've done up until now. So that's what we're working towards. But for today, just creating code chunks. Um, and with that, I'm just going to leave you to it. Um, and then I will be on Slack. And so we'll learn with Greg to kind of help you through that. And that's it. Gabby, can I ask a clarifying question? Um, sure. In the past, I think I found that I needed my whole script in my knit in my um, markdown file. The whole script has to run without errors for it to knit. Um, mm -hmm. Is that true? Yeah. Does it have yeah. to? Okay. And I think a workflow tip I'll give, um, having made this um, answer key, is I'll start from the top and I will take in just like a single bit of code at a time and then run it bit by bit without error um, before actually, yeah. So rather than just like copying and pasting all the code from today, I would just do it like by logical sections. So by one type of analysis, by one type of plot, for example, 
um, and then make sure those separate sections run uh, before I actually uh, knit it. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, but as you can see here, the finished document, because I've made so many different headers, will actually have like a nice document skeleton. So this is what the main header will look like, and then they'll indent as the headers become smaller and smaller or more fine tuned. So does anybody have any questions about this point? I can answer them. What do you suggest to, uh, to paste in there? Um, yeah, so why don't we do a couple together, actually? I think that's probably going to be best to get us started. In. So here, I've just set the working directory, and I've read the table that we've already read today. And again, you can run them line by line. Mm -hmm. And then they'll allow you to see them. Sometimes code chunks are kind of finicky in that they'll run just like all together rather than row by row. But this sometimes helps you, you know, um, debug along the way. So now you see that this code chunk runs fine. Once you have this, I would move on to creating another one. So just, you would write out three ticks, then the curly breaks again with R, and then we'd name it code chunk two, for example. And then close it off over here. We're just going to go back here and go to the next um, I like to call them logical groupings, but really just, it can be an, an arbitrary number of lines. So long as they run all together without error, we're going to copy them and paste them just here within the code chunk. And then to check our work, we're just going to press play. And then we're going to see that it runs without error. Mm -hmm. Then we're just going to continue on. And as we build this file, we poured over all this code, we see that our final report grows with the output. Okay. And that's it for today. And then tomorrow we're kind of going to talk about how to make tables look nicer, how to give figures captions and um, titles and, and so on. Is that label co code chunk and code chunk two, does that come, like, does that get knit or is that just sort of for reference when you're writing it? It's just for reference when you're writing it. So that won't be like a section label or something. The section labels will come from um, the actual text that you put ahead of the code chunk, which can just be written the way you would write like normal English text in like any other word processing um, location. So here is some text that describes my code. The comment portion won't appear as like text labels then, because no. it's within the chunk. Exactly. It will appear as a um, comment within the code chunk itself. Okay. So I'll leave this up maybe. I think that's perhaps a bit more in the slide.
there's no way to like highlight a portion and be like, make this a code chunk in the same way that you would highlight a portion and turn that into a comment, right? I don't believe so. Okay. Um, no, I don't think so. Yeah, unfortunately, this part is a bit tedious, which is kind of why I wanted to, I wanted it to be the last thing that we did today. And uh, the only thing, so it's not too heavy a day. Tomorrow will be quite a bit of um, playing around with actual commands. Yeah, Lambert, right now, that's exactly what you want to happen. We're going to make it look a lot nicer and more readable tomorrow. But for now, I just want all the code that we've written today to work in an R Markdown form. And that's it. Dahlia, do you mind just moving all that code that you have um, outside the chunk, inside the chunk, and then seeing if that resolves your error? Uh, kind of, it won't be a PDF. It'll probably be a .html. But if it doesn't open up on its own as a pop-up, it should just be in the same directory that you created your markdown. Gabby, you can't set your working directory within Markdown, right? The chunks, they won't let you do it? They won't let you do it persistently, but it shouldn't throw an error. Emma, did this command work for you before, earlier in the day? Um, yeah, I, yeah, I had no problems with it before. Um, do I, I need find, it? sorry, go ahead. Do I need it? No, generally, if you're already working in the same directory where the data is, you really don't have to worry about it as much. And if it's really giving you a lot of trouble, you can just move um, all of the location mapping that you have in set working directory into the retable call itself, like just before the file name, and that will run just as well. So generally, set working directory is like not the command that you would want to use in Markdown. You would want to use one of the NIDR um, like built-in functions for setting a directory because it'll set working directory, we'll set it just for the code chunk. And so it'll yell at you and give you a bunch of different errors when you try to do that. Um, I have a different error when I remove it and just run the second line for the second chunk. It could be that your Markdown file is just in a different location than the data. So what I would do is I would just copy the desktop slash intro to R, um, like that whole string, and then put it in the same location as um, the string in the read table call. So instead of this, I would just do this command.
So Emma, it seems that your R code chunk is um is not closed properly. Can you try to just start a new line with just the ticks underneath it and see if that resolves your issue? What's um attempt oh. to use zero length variable name? Um I think that um, since this is your first code chunk, I don't think you can actually, so you'd want to start at the very beginning of the script that we ran through earlier today. But so, not in the set working directory. Um, no, if you have the data file itself already loaded, then you don't really need to run it again. But you would want to start from here just to make sure that you have the same variables in your environment that you had before. One other thing, Emma, when you tried to run this, did you press the play button on the side or did you just like select all and then press command enter like you did with the other scripts? I just did command enter just like yeah. randomly. Right, so, right. That's kind of an important thing to mention. But um, if you press command, so if you just do like command A and then press command enter, um, well, we should generally yell at you, but yeah, there we go. Attempt to use zero length variable name. Um, it just means that R read it and tried to run it as just like a general R script, um, which obviously it's not because it's got all these like different ticks and like code names and, and YAML and all that stuff. So you'd actually want to either knit it or run each chunk independently with the play button. So the workflow here is just a tad different than it would be for just a pure script. Okay. Yeah. I feel like I just don't know what's happening. <laughs> okay. Um, why don't we start from the top in terms of just the workflow? So let's start a whole new file and we'll go from there. So we have our report try. And we're going to make it in HTML, which we've already done successfully. Uh, we have this YAML that just has the title and a bunch of different strings that don't do much other than tell us that the output is an HTML document. Then here is just like some pre-populated code, which shows here is, um, this is just plain text. And over here between the ticks is our code. So these are the names of the code chunks so that when we send it to someone to look at or to contribute to, we can be specific about how we refer to it. For now, that's really the only um, purpose that these code chunk names have. Uh, include false just means that we won't see the output when we actually run it in the knitted file. And that's helpful to us because this is just some setup code that we don't really want to see in a report that shows like our analysis, for example. Will it work if you don't put include false? For sure, it'll just um, include it. So we can do that. So this is what it would look like knit. So first we'd have to save it. So we'll try and we're going to put it here. So we can name data after. This runs and then this actually doesn't have any output, so perhaps this is a bad example, but let's give it something to work with. It will work though, 
is like that thing, that particular command, the include true or include false, won't give you an error either way. All it'll do is it'll copy what is happening in the console into the actual document that is being rendered. So I'll take a command that's a bit noisy here. In our other file, we have all of this stuff, right? This outputs like a whole table, it shows like the names of in the data frame, so the names of the columns. Uh, it shows what happens when you run head, which is the first five rows, or six rows rather. Uh, and then we have the dimensions and the structure. So if we press knit now, what we see is all of that output line by line. Perhaps in some cases, that's a bit noisy for us because we ran those commands so that we want to know them, but we wouldn't necessarily want like this kind of unstructured list to show up in our report. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to separate the names out into a different code chunk, and then I'm going to suppress the output for it. So what I'm going to do is close this one and then start a new one. Our, and we're going to call it code chunk 1.5. Again, because the name doesn't matter much to us. And then I'm going to include false over here. Uh, what I expect to happen is the output from names will no longer be um, shown. So when I run names of data frame two, it outputs this list. When I knit this new file with include equals false, what will happen is that whole code chunk will disappear. So we won't even see it. So it ran in the background when the file was knit, but the output from it and the code itself doesn't show up. If instead we wrote echo equals false, what would happen is this. So the code chunk di didn't show up, but the output of it did. And so for today, this is kind of something that's nice to know. We'll go into it in a lot more detail tomorrow as we do the exercise. But just so no one feels lost. Over. Now, what are you seeing when you press knit? Is it just that the HTML doesn't finish loading? Uh, yeah, in the R markdown tab where the console is, uh, it just sort of keeps spinning. Interesting. If you try to just restart R Studio, um, Sometimes it lags, but I'm not sure. Maybe, Greg, do you want to take Hannah to a breakout room to kind of see what's happening? Yep, no problem. Well, cool, thank you.
So if you want to share this with a collaborator, it depends on what part you want to share. If you just want to share the results from the analysis, um, you can just knit it and send them the actual knit document. And that's all they would need to see. So I would send them just the PDF from what I did before or just the HTML, and then that would be enough. Um, if you want them to contribute to it, then yeah, you would have to give them the data source as well, the same way that you would with like a regular R script. Okay, so we have Christina started. It seems, and um, Salman, did you end up being able to run it? I see that you have the line with themes that actually commented out. So was that was that you trying to resolve it? Or yeah, was... that's commented out after the error, seeing the error. I don't know why, because the first chunk it ran well, mm -hmm. but then I got into second chunk and I thought it's issue with the theme. I don't know. It's, with the library or package. Um. Okay. Um, when you find splitting up the chunks, I find that this kind of helps you get a more specific error message that way. Coming in? So try to split up the chunks um, before the theme starts. So until, I guess, the last day that runs. And then run it as a continuously active until you get the error message. I find sometimes. Hi, so sorry. So you are not able to go and break out rooms. You should be Greg and. So, Rashad, we're not able to send yep. people. I'm allowed now, as soon as Rashad came back. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. So I'll, I'll leave it like this. I'll just uh, uh, close my my script, my uh, camera and, and mic. I, I, I won't leave the, the Zoom. Okay. And if you don't, anything, don't leave us, Rashad. If anything, slack me. Okay. Thank you. We will. Okay, so Nakla, it actually, if it ran once, then it means that the HTML is fine. Um, if you want to try to run, like um, render it as a PDF, you're going to have to first install uh, LaTeX, which Lauren had pasted the command for a bit earlier today. Uh, I'm really sorry about this. I meant to give you the command before we started the section. But I need to have a Hello? Hello? So, yeah. so, 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 so I need the code, uh, the command to download like latex, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I think I think my mind is fried now. So. Okay, that's why I didn't want too much uh, to do before six fifteen today. I really just wanted all of you to try to get things into code chunks and have them like render as an HTML, and that's entirely it. And like, if you got to that point today, then we're all done. And feel free to like head out and be with your families. Okay. We'll be a bit more involved and more detailed, but really for today, all we want is like, what does the file itself look like? And how do we like copy and paste code into chunks that run? And uh, there was a comment, a question by Carmen. So if you want to share this with the I mean, you, it depends if your collaborator has similar data, then they can run your script on their data, right? But if you want them to reproduce or verify, or you want to share your data, then you do have to share your data as well. And they have to load it up in R and then run the way to the analysis. Something to clarify here is, this is a report that you don't run any code on. So if someone wants to run their data through something, share a script because then you can run the script. This is gonna be yeah. a PDF. You can't run this at all. It's just reporting what's been done. And so- but it explains, but it explains cases, what I you did, share right? Data. Yeah, exactly. It just explains what you've done. It doesn't yeah. allow someone to rerun what you've done. Only a script no. would do that. Yeah. 
And then for that, you would share the script, you would share the data. And so just to be in the open-mindedness of R and R Studio and Markdown and all of those things, that's, it's a way of, of data sharing. It's a way of explaining what you did. But like Lauren just said, the, the, the R Markdown document doesn't share that much in a way. It explains what you did, but it doesn't share the data. It doesn't share the script. You have to do that separately. But someone could look at it and know, okay, that's what they did. Like an understand. Yeah. And sure. Then, yeah. 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 And, 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 like they, you... and they would say, and then maybe build a collaboration. Say, oh, oh, this is really interesting. I'd like to do that with my data. Can we work together? And can you share your script and so forth? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so this is a really great starting off point for if you've done something like quite complex and you want to feature it like on your lab's website um, as a you know a blog post or just like a way to have like very lightweight scientific communication. This is a great way to like take little pieces of your big script and just feature them to show people how to do a certain aspect of your analysis. Hannah, is it still um, compiling for you? Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Um, Gabby, did did you know about this error? Um, it, it just never stops compiling the markdown file. Mm -hmm. um, so she goes to knit, and then it just keeps kind of running. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I asked her to, to quit R and start it start up again. Mm -hmm. OK. I, yeah, I wasn't sure. Mm -hmm. But it didn't. That's um, a tough one. And I didn't fix it for you. I think she's still doing that. Yeah, no. Oh, I see. No. Okay. I paired the the actual R commands down to almost nothing, and it was still. Like yeah, was exactly. Setting, setting the directory, and mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Maybe we duplicated effort on that. Sorry. No worries. Yeah. I'm glad no one had like a wiser or not glad, but I was really like, I, I've done all I can do. <laughs> it, I can only make it simple and so simple, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, I've never come across a problem like that. I'm just looking up now to see if yeah. the stack overflow will work. So some of you, oh, sorry, go ahead, Gabby. I was just wondering if the, if, uh, or Greg or Hannah, if the code chunks themselves ran independently, like before the knitting, or if that was also hanging. Yeah, they uh, yeah it, it was, it was running. It would run. It just wouldn't knit. Yep. And it's just a long running knit. Yeah. Uh, Hannah, when you are back up again on our studio, can you try installing the R markdown package again? Like maybe you just had an error in installation and that's kind of where the issue was. Sorry, which package? So uh, you would just want to run this. So install packages and then uh, R markdown. And this is fine. If it restarts the R session, it'll kind of keep all your environment variables. Um, okay, so at the top here, we have our YAML, what they call metadata. So what this means is just like, these are the set of um, settings that you're going to give your file. So here, and I will repeat this 
when we get to the appropriate slide, you have the types of output that you want to render. So you have your HTML document, you have your PDF document, and then some other settings I'll talk about. And then on top, you have places where you can specify the title of your file, the date that it will have been published at, and then your name as the author. Over here, we talked about this code chunk. It's called setup. And we can name it whatever we want, but they have to be unique within a document, the individual names. Uh, we write false here so that we don't include the output from the code um, within our file. And then we have our libraries as we know to include them um, from when we did earlier lessons. And then this is how we read the data frames. So very similar to the workflow that we've done so far. And then we need it just up here the knit button, because I have these two lines, HTML document, PDF document, it will output both. Uh, and so this is an example of the HTML class. So over here, you see the table of contents, which I'll teach you in a minute how to specify. And it kind of gives us a way to traverse our file. Uh, and this is what it will look like. And then likewise, you have your PDF, which will look very similar but in kind of a more um, traditional, you know, publication format. All right, so with that refresher, I'm going to move on to the slide. Okay, so the first thing you may have noticed is that there's all different kinds of what our Markdown calls picks that help us format the text in our uh, Markdown file in different ways. So one of them is this single tick. And um, if you notice in Slack, sometimes the text that I write in the answers to you guys is like uh, a bit orange and it has this console font. And if you want to do something similar to signify a variable name, for example, in your report, that's exactly how you would use it here. So the Slack comment box actually uh, recognizes a lot of Markdown um, syntax and so do other places around the web. So it's kind of nice because um, though this is a particular R flavor of Markdown, R Markdown itself is used across a lot of different platforms. Uh, then we have this single tick with the letter R in front of it before this, which looks like a very small R command. So the function mean called on data frame two um, and the H column. And this is how you would add inline code into your paragraphs. So if you call this within a piece of text that you're writing in Markdown, what will actually be output is this number over here, which is equivalent to the mean age that's in the data frame. And so it's very helpful when you're talking about results in like a, a paragraph format so that you don't have to use the code itself. As the only way to explain yourself, you can use also uh, just embedded or inline code. And then the last one is a code chunk, which you're all familiar with. And that's when you have the three ticks at the front and then the curly brace, the letter R, the name of the code chunk, and then uh, echo or include depending on uh, what you want the code chunk to do. Okay, so now we're going to talk a bit about readability upgrades. So the first thing that I wanted to talk about are the output types. So when you specify HTML document and the PDF documents under output here, you'll see that when you press knit, it'll actually create both file types at once. And there are many more options um, to create many different other file types uh, like slides that come in both PowerPoint and um, more default formats that are like more Mac friendly, if that's something that you're interested in. And also, um, <laughs> Um, and, and then also Word documents. So it can actually put out a dot doc, for example, which then you can continue to edit in just Microsoft. Um, this isn't something that you'd ever, you know, be expected to know off the top of your head. And, you know, myself and Lauren and Greg, I'm sure, like don't know much beyond the things that we use day to day. But at the end of this um, lecture, I will give you links for cheat sheets and references where you can find this information over and over again. And again, like Google, you know, every programmer is asking. Okay, so moving on, the next thing to note are, uh, is this number of sections, 
which, um, sorry, number underscore sections. And if you select true on this in both PDF and uh, HTML documents, it will allow you to number the sections in your markdown. So what this actually looks like is if you would noticed in the PDF, for example, we have, um, in here we have section one, section two, section three, and then 3.1. And then under investigating the data frame, this is numbered section one. And so if you would like these numberings to exist rather than just have the header on its own without the numbering, that's kind of how you go about specifying that. And then as you add on to your markdown document, that will update automatically. And then the last thing is um, the TOC, which is table of contents and the depth of the table of contents. So table of contents true is just how you would turn on this particular feature. And it's the same for both PDF documents and for HTML documents. Um, and then when you select TOC underscore depth two, uh, all that will do is it will specify in the table of contents how many levels you want to have uh, as a navigation. So two is kind of, you know, uh, I think a good selection generally speaking, and it'll just be like next to the bottom. And so at this point, uh, I'm just going to pause to give you all a chance to add this to the markdown file that you had um, yesterday. So at the very top where you have your existing YAML, all you'll do is you'll add this text. And then when you're ready, um, just select yes or no, depending on whether or not you have an issue. Uh, how do we create a new Markdown file? So you want to open up the oh. one that you registered. I, I think I overwrote the stuff that were there yesterday. It's fine. Uh, in that case, you can just um, go here to File, and mm -hmm. then under New File, you'll select our Markdown. Oh, yeah. Okay. And then you just specify the title and press OK. And it'll sure. be uh, Markdown. Let me just move that over here. Okay, nice. I'm seeing some yeses, but we're fine. Okay, I'll give you all uh, maybe another half a minute and then we'll move on. And again, there'll be time at the end to catch up if you didn't quite get there. Okay, so the next thing we'll talk about uh, are different ways we can format our text. So um, you can choose to write plain text in your markdown documents, and this will just render as a regular paragraph. Um, but there are much 
there are many more options that you can choose from. And as you can see here, this is uh, exactly the type of syntax that you'd want to use outside of the code chunks for you to be able to render each one of these header levels and italicize and bolded text. So one thing to note is um, our markdown is really picky about um, new lines. So after each one of these lines, you'd want to you know, um, very deliberately press enter uh, or add two spaces um, after the end of each of these text lines so that the next line renders appropriately. And I'll uh, repeat this again and have a reference when we get to the exercise. Uh, and then here is how we would order lists. And you know, lists can be made in many different ways depending on what is appropriate for the text that you're trying to, um, to render. So you have unordered, and then you have ordered or mixed lists. And how you would start this is you just like add a little dash at the beginning of your line. And then again, two spaces or uh, enter at the end. And then if you want to nest it, what you would want to do is you'd want to add four spaces before the start of your dash. And so when you press knit, our markdown will note that there are four spaces exactly uh, between the start of the line and the start of your dash. And it will indent the, um, uh, the list item. And then we'll also change the list marker so that when people read it, they can see that um, it's like a nested subject. You can also do the same thing with numbered lists. And also, you can have a mixed type of list. So here we have two as the marker or the numbering of the item. And then inside, you have an unordered uh, nested item. Uh, so now we're just going to do a quick practice. Debbie? Yeah. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Um, if can you check on Slack? There's there's uh, some students with uh, that are getting errors about not having LaTeX installed, and I don't want them to get too far behind. So I don't know the quickest way to get. Uh, yeah. So to make sure everything is working. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Yeah. I Can thought... they just not do the PDF like that? That's an easy way to avoid it, and yeah. then just output oh. HTML. What you can do for now is you can just. Um, knit to HTML exclusively. So select that here. So um, yeah, over here, you would just not include these options. Um, and then when we have a break for the exercise, we can kind of talk about that. You can install like a lightweight version. You can install tiny tech, which shouldn't take too long. It's just an R package, but just in the interest of not falling behind. Um, for now, just delete this section of your code and knit Perfect. it on HTML. And then I'll open up the participants panel and um... yeah, and I just added to on the Slack um, installed up packages tiny tech also uh, may make it possible, I think. Um, but if that's not working too, yeah, just cut the PDF. Mm -hmm. Gabby, do you think you could specify what the text you're talking about? It's outside a chunk, right? So when you're talking about text, this is all stuff that's written not in a chunk. And then the chunk is just in containing code, right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So in the chunk, you'd only have code or comments on the code the way that we've had so far. And then outside the chunks, you would just have either plain text or this uh, syntax that we just talked about. So here I have like all the different headers and the italicized and bolded text that I mentioned. Here we have all the different list types. And then a plus sign is just another way to do the same kind of marker. Um, and then over here is what I have for our exercise. So this is just a combination of all the different texts that we learned, and then the headers and the um, list properties. And then when you knit it, what will actually happen is I Open and read it out. Um, <laughs> you'll get this. So this is what header one will look like. This is header two, uh, header three, and then these are all the different stylings of um, the things that we've mentioned up until now. 
Wonderful, thank you. So I'll go back to the exercise text. Once you have this working, if you could just give me a quick yes. Uh, and if you're having issues, if you could just give me a quick no or just unmute yourself and ask the question, that's also fine. Sorry, I'm not sure what we need to do now. <laughs> yeah, so uh, you're going what? to copy the code that's in here. Yeah. Into markdown file. And then you're going to knit it to see what this actually looks like when the file is knit. Oh, okay. okay. Okay, nice. We have a yes. Just give it another minute. Great. Okay, so uh, moving on, we're going to talk now about how to insert tables into our markdown. So what you may have noticed yesterday, if you managed to get your uh, R markdown file running with the existing script, is that tables don't really render super nicely or you know, perhaps not even at all. And that's because with R markdown inside the chunks, what you would want is you'd want to use this um, knit R function. Uh, called cable. And knit R is uh, just the, the knitting um, compiler, I guess. So what it'll do is like it'll look at all your code chunks and then it'll just render it in the format that you specified in uh, that top bit of, of setup. Um, and this is just something that you kind of need to keep in the back of your head. So whenever you have a table or a data frame that you'd like to display in like this nicely formatted sort of way, you would want to just wrap the entire table function with cable. So you would have this knit r and then two uh, colons, then cable, and then inside you have your table object. And this can be either a table as you've prepared before, or it could just be a, a data frame. And then the last bit here is the uh, caption that you can set. This is just an argument of the cable function, which will add, uh, it's funny because it's, it's actually more of a title. Um, it will add uh, this bit of text above your table uh, so that you can name it whatever you'd like. And so at this point, I'm just going to pause and give all of you uh, a chance to try this. So in case you uh, didn't manage to port your code from yesterday, 
all you'd want to do is you'd want to copy the table commands from the script from uh, yesterday or earlier today. And you just want to wrap knit r around each of these table calls within a single chunk. And that should do it. Okay, yes, Christina. So there is actually a distinction here that's in perhaps important to make, and that's that uh, these ticks are not actually single quotations, but rather they're actual tick marks. Um, and um, the way you'd find them is they're usually kind of to the left of your uh, one key at the top of your keyboard. They look like this rather than a single quotation, which is flat. So they're going to be like a little bit angled to the left. And that's what R will recognize. So it's the same way that you'd open a code chunk. You'd want to use those. Lauren, those are right. So they'll render differently on a PDF versus an HTML, and it just depends on your screen size. So at the bottom here, I have screenshots from what it would look like as a PDF. And on an HTML, they usually render just a tiny bit differently. Okay, so shoot me a, a yes if you've managed to kind of get these working. Nice. Awesome. I like seeing a check mark. Okay, so Ren, we're going to just do the same workflow that we did yesterday. So the way this will look is you're going to go to the um, markdown file that you just opened up. And as you can see over here, you have what we call a code chunk. So the okay. way is uh, you would just type three ticks like that, then uh, curly brace under, under that, okay. Yeah, and then just type R and then name of code chunk. So the name can be anything you'd like. They just can't repeat within uh, a single file. And then you type three ticks like that to code chunk. And then in here, you'd want to type all your code. So in this case, all you really have to do is go to the um, file that you were working on yesterday and earlier today. And for now, all we're doing is we're taking these and just copying them into an existing code chunk. Then we're going back and uh, wrapping them up in this function. So you'll take, oh, 
Whoops. Um, so you'll want to take knit R and then two colons and cable, and then just wrap it around that table object. So you'll just um, do an opening bracket at the start of the table object and a closing Ooh. bracket at the end. And what this will do is it'll render the table like really nicely for you and kind of center it on the page. And make it OK. Can you put your uh, our studio screen for a second on? Sure. So yeah. it would look like this. So you just type knit r and then two colons, and the function is called cable. Mm. And you can highlight the rest of the line and then just um, type an opening bracket, and that will um, wrap, so to speak, um, the code that you have in an opening parenthesis and a closing parenthesis. And then this, oh, oh, I think it's just right here. Good. What do we do wrong here? Oh, my um, data frame might be. Oh, yeah. That's why I called it. Should you read? Should you have it read in the data on the first um, code chunk? Is that? Uh, yeah. You oh gosh right. Um, yeah, but if you do have it in your environment, it it should work. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, at least running it within your R Studio frame, like it when you knit it, it might give you a bit of trouble. Okay. But when you're just running it like chunk by chunk, it should should. Work. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, one thing. Right. Yeah, this is one of those things that kind of a bit of a caveat with our markdown in that some functions don't render great within our studio itself, and you do have to knit them to actually make them work. So if you do get this, um, like, difference in, in argument lengths, for example, it might just be that you need to knit it to actually see it in action. Okay, so Diego, T. Oh, Diego, I see what the problem is. On line 31, your caption is outside of the actual uh, cable function. So you would want it to be uh, right in here. So the way that would look is just within the same cable call. It's just another argument for that very same question. Right. Yeah. So when I do that, it uh it gives me like an X on the side and it says there's an unexpected comma. Um, I'll, 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 I'll send a screenshot of what I'm talking about. Yeah, I think that might be because you're putting the comma after this the double bracket. So you want to put it after the first bracket. Okay, yeah, okay, I get that. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, let me know if that works. So Christina, you might have an issue just with uh, LaTeX itself, in which case maybe try first to see if it works if you just take out the PDF section of um, your top and then try to render it just as an HTML.
Okay, so I think we're going to move on. And again, there'll be more time for parents to kind of catch up if you're not quite there yet. Right. So the next bit is um, a bit hairy than we've already gotten, perhaps, um, and that's working with plot. So this part, um, I think, is like the, the most ad hoc you could possibly get in programming. Uh, like it really depends on how big your plots are, what their margins are, uh, how much data you have, what the text size is in those, all of those things play a factor. But what you can do to make them fit in nicely within your reports is you can set figure width and figure height um, within the code chunk. And what this will do is it will set that particular width and height for the code chunk that has your plots. So here I set it to 10 and four because that's what worked best with my machine. Um, and then uh, I think that should work. If it renders it in a way that looks kind of funky or it's a bit you know, uh, too wide for your uh, screen, then you can play around with the width. Uh, the height was just like how much space it actually takes on the page. So sometimes it will force the next bit of text to skip to the next page, in which case you'd want to decrease the height. Uh, so you'd really just want to play around with this until it looks the way you want it to. The other thing you can do is you can uh, have separate code chunks for different plots. So in my case, when I plotted all three of them together, it um, forced um, one of them to the next page. And so it, it kind of made for a not very continuous reading experience. So I just split them up and uh, that managed to kind of sort out the spacing issue. So I'm sure a lot of you have similar problems with like Word, for example, where you kind of have to play around with a, a figure and resize it until it fits the way you'd like. And this is very much the same kind of thing. These are just tips for how you would go about fixing those kinds of errors when they occur. Uh, yeah, so I'm just going to talk through a bunch of these types of techniques, and then we're going to go to the exercise at the end. And so we have enough time to, to give everyone to do that. Okay, so the next thing you can do is a bit more code focused, and that's you can actually um, change the limits of your plot. So if you recall, our old, um, uh, our old plot had space from zero to 40 on the y-axis here. And so when I first uh, rendered it or knit it, it pushed the legend kind of out of the way until I couldn't see it anymore. And that's just the way that uh, our managed to like knit the file. What I did instead is I gave it a little bit more space. So I made the limits of the plot from zero to 45 instead. It's just like a tiny bit of extra space up top over here. And that allowed me to add the legend in a way that I liked. Another space saving um, strategy is to change your legend, uh, to change your legend's location. So in my case, it was rendered kind of like half off of the margins of the figure. So I moved it to the very top the very beginning, so the leftmost side, at the 45. So this second number is just the y coordinate of where your legend will start. So here you specify the, the top left corner, I suppose, of the legend margins in base R. Uh, and then the last thing that you can do is you can change your legend from a vertical orientation, which is the default, to a horizontal one that has two columns. And that's just the end call argument at the end over here. So if you just pop that into your existing legend code, it'll just orient it in this row wise way and uh, it'll fit very nicely in like what is generally, or like what is otherwise like a, a kind of small tight figure. And then this is an example where everything works right. I just wanted to show you that it's not always such a headache. Um, so in this case, what was uh, kind of a bit of perhaps a mission to set up actually ended up being uh, quite simple. So this is just an example of how code you've already written can be plopped in pretty nicely a lot of the times in R Markdown. And this is, I want to reiterate, this is a general case, like I've really chosen examples that need a lot of um, tinkering with to make work, but generally speaking, it is just meant for you to be able to uh, port 
fairly easily from your analysis to a presentable format. Uh, yeah, and so this is how you'd actually add a caption. So again, the code here is very much the same ggplot code that you'd already written yesterday. There's no difference. Um, the only difference with this code chunk is that we have our figure caption. So we've now learned three different uh, settings that we can add to our code chunk that will control the way that our figures are rendered. The first is figure width. The second is figure height. And the last is figure caption, so fig. And what you'd want to do here is you just want to use paste and then a string that describes your figure. Uh, and that will render the way this renders below in a PDF uh, as a caption. Uh, and that's it in terms of the things that I wanted to cover. What I want to give you now is a chance to go through these slides on your own for the next, uh, let's say, 20 minutes or so. Um, and then just really play around with the plots, uh, give them captions, uh, give them headings, uh, make your tables nicely formatted, and then try to render them in HTML and PDF and see what that looks like. Uh, and you know, Lauren and Greg and I will be here to answer questions. And uh, I will, uh, so the links to these uh, slides are, is on the website and I can, I can pop a, a link to that in the Slack in just a minute. Um, once you're done with uh, playing around with your code and you're kind of comfortable with our markdown, the next thing you're going to do is you're going to try to actually change the data source in your R markdown file. And I'll plop the link to that as well, but uh, Lauren has prepared a second data source for us, which in structure looks exactly like the um, data frame two that we've worked with today and on the latter half of yesterday. It just has um, updated rows. And so the goal here is to see like whether or not your analysis has changed uh, after you've changed a data source. And then just compare and contrast the two data sources and see uh, how your data has impacted your findings. So with that, does anybody have any questions? One more thing I will add is at the end of these slides, I have a few links to the R Markdown cheat sheet and the reference guide. And these, you know, every time you work with R Markdown, they're absolute lifesavers. So they'll have the exact commands that you'd want for any sort of like specifics that you want to include in your report. I encourage you to look at them as you kind of go through this exercise to get familiarized with what the resources look like out there. So I'm just going to send you the link from the Lauren, do you have the link from the course website handy that you can just pop down in the chat? Yeah, the course website link? Uh, yeah, just to the slides. It's oh, yeah. Uh, Carmen it's just uh, linked the slides as well. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, Carmen. Um, and it's pinned. It's there. And please refer to the website because we update the material. Um, and then Gabby, are you going to go over this um, once we, so we're going to take 20 minutes and kind of work on our markdown files and then you'll go, okay, great. And I will also post the answers at the end of today. So if you don't, uh, get all the way to a result that you're happy with, um, you can always take a look at it this evening. Gabrielle, can you take this few minutes to, to add the, the source to the GitHub link to the GitHub page now? 
So it's gonna be more a bit. I I rather have this than the. Uh, What do you do when the um, the error says figure margins too large calls? Um, I think it really depends, but you could solve it the same way that you solved it earlier today. So for example, um, if you have something that you want, uh, where is the function? Yeah, so in this case, you'll see that I use like the par MF row that we use to uh, make you know, faceted plots. You can use the very same thing um, in the um, uh, in the markdown file that you have been using to set the margins elsewhere. Yeah, that's actually exactly what I'm doing. That's exactly what I have. The par and the row, and then one and five. Um, and then I was just trying to change the size because the mm -hmm. or the um, labels were getting cut off. But <laughs> you might also instead want to play around with the figure width and the figure height. And then but I've tried all sorts of numbers. Okay, do you want to paste the screenshot of your code maybe? We can play around with it. Sure. Oh, so Emma, if you take a look, your figure width and figure height are quite small. So those are actually in inches. So like they they map to the height and width that you would have like on either a screen or, or a sheet of paper. So you, you'd want the width to be closer, I think, to the 10 for a bigger plot like this. Yeah, so that's what it was originally. Um, I guess I can just keep, I guess I'll just keep playing around with it until it's happy. <laughs> That's a lot of what this workflow looks like, actually, unfortunately. Gabby, can we get your help um, on a, a question Christina's asking right above Emma's? Um, so she, I think, installed a uh, tiny tech, and it's still giving that error around um, looking for me tech. Um, mm -hmm. It's, yeah. Hmm. I don't think I've ever seen this error, but we can Google it and see what we get. Um, sorry, in the meantime, Christina, could you run uh, the install uh, tiny tech? Um, yeah, so you shouldn't actually have to run the library tiny tech in your code chunk. Uh, that kind of happens in in silence as you knit. Um, so I would actually remove that just to see if that stops the error. But I'm sure that's not the only thing. But just I tried with and without, but I'll try it without again. Yeah, it, it yeah, you you really shouldn't have to use it. Did you just try to run um, just the install packages command for tiny tech, just in case maybe it installed with errors yesterday. Um, and then it maybe, you know, didn't, didn't give you an error message or maybe you missed it. Sometimes that happens, but in the meantime, I will also take a look at this. 
Lauren, did you ever get an error like this running Markdown? No? No, I've not seen this one. Um, so I was wondering if. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing, but. Um, hmm. It, it like did the whole thing again, installed it again the way it did before. Um, and it's still, but it still says successful. I can put a screenshot of that. Oh, Diego, so you have a space um, at the top um, between output and HTML document. If you could just remove that and try to knit again, I think that might be the issue. Okay, uh, Christina, sometimes you have to run these additionally. Can you try to run that and see if that fixes the issue? Sorry, run what? Um, so I just pasted it in the thread, but um, oh. TinyTech sometimes like updates or installs itself in the background. Um, so maybe if you force it to do that, it'll do something. Um, Oh, Emma, um, so I just noticed that you have a space in the name of the chunk on line 78. I was wondering if that was giving you trouble when you're knitting the document. Um, it didn't, but I removed it anyways. Okay. I actually have a weird glitch right now. I was just trying to, like, I'm just putting everything we did into that 
um, markdown and I was putting the like looped T test in. And I think it's like looping the table forever. Like, I don't know. You think you have like an infinite loop there? Well, 17 pages, so it's not infinite, but <laughs> just proceeding. Yeah, but. that's maybe too many pages, I think, for how many t-tests we're actually running. Um, yeah, it's only five, but I think, I don't know what's happening. It doesn't matter, I'll see. <laughs> Okay, so Lauren, um, what timing works for you in terms of what you wanted to do for the next bit? Um, I was thinking we would go until That's about it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, four thirty, and then I would go over the solutions for maybe yeah. like ten minutes. Yeah, and that's all we have. Um, and then uh, yeah, and then you just review what uh, is there, and that's it. Okay. Yeah. Cool. 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 So I'm going to give us maybe five extra minutes. And in the meantime, I'm just going to actually post the solutions right away so that when they go through them, um, whoever's interested can follow along with their own file. I'm not sure if you mentioned it, but in terms of the numbering, I might have missed it, but can you remove the numbers? Uh, the section numbering? Yeah. Yeah, so at the top, all you'd want to do is just delete this. Oh, got it. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Or set it to false if you don't want to like go about uh, erasing those and such.
Uh, okay, I think I'm going to go through the solutions now. And uh, I believe that uh, Rashad has actually posted them on the course website. So if you go there, they'll be at the very bottom and uh, you can follow along or you can play with it, you know, uh, later this week or, you know, perhaps later today, depending on how keen you're feeling after this. <laughs> uh, hold up, I'm just, um, I figured out keyboard was just working for a second. Okay, so this is what the full solution will look like. And we've kind of looked at the finished product a few times now, but I'll go through it again in a minute. Um, what I've done here is I've also pasted the um, code that we use to make all the different types of headers, just as a reference. And here we have the numbered list items and um, the unnumbered list items or unordered. Uh, you can make lists with all kinds of different symbols. So there's the plus signs and the dashes. Later on, uh, I also show you that you can use an asterisk. They all render more or less the same way. Uh, on some machines, they will change the actual marker and you can just play around and see which one uh, kind of suits you best. Um, on the right, you'll see a skeleton of your document. So you'll be able to navigate the different parts of your code where you've created headers. Uh, and the indentations are just like the level of the header. So these are subheadings and then it'll indent even further with each additional subheading level that you've added. Um, and so over here, we have the list that we've implemented earlier. So this is a single tick to show um, just syntax highlighting. Uh, here we have the inline code. Gabby, can I ask a quick question at this point? Um, right here, uh, Diego had uh, an error that said, mm -hmm. um, and like uh, right where you're at this quick stats, it says that um, object type closure is not subsettable. Um, I feel like that usually happens when the object that you're trying to access doesn't exist. Yeah, right. And and so it ran fine in the chunk above, mm -hmm. and then it doesn't run in the quick in the quick stats for some reason. Like it like when in these tick mark sections. Right. Hmm. If you don't know off the top of your head, we can look at it after. I'm just wondering if. Yeah. Um. Diego, did you try to knit the file when he gave you that error or did you try to run like a single? Yeah, so when I try to knit it to either PDF or the HTML, like both, all of my data chunks run fine, but it always comes to an issue when it comes to that. Interesting. And is it just, uh, let me check the screenshot on the slide. Yeah, it's the, the screenshot bit. Mm -hmm. It's line 30. Five, you said? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that first line of the quick stats. Mm -hmm. Could something have happened to DF dollar age? Like, does that column still exist in the data frame? Yeah, if you go up here and then you uh, just click, oh, yeah, you can do that. Um, so if you click this button here, does age have a bunch of integers in it? Yeah, yeah, so age is still, yeah, it's still there. Like it's still a column in the, in the DF data frame. Yeah. And if you run like just this portion in your console like that, does it return a number for you? So if I run the, uh, like just the code? Just yeah. the mean and then uh, brackets df dollar sign h in the console. Uh, yeah, now still, it says error unexpected symbol in R mean. Uh, sorry, you wouldn't want to, you would just want in the console, you would just want to type mean. So you don't need the R here. Or you would oh, just yeah, okay. Then it gives the mean, yeah. Okay. Maybe we'll deal with it after this then. Yeah, <laughs> seems like a deep yeah no, I don't, I don't want to hold anything up. <laughs> like no, it. no, sorry. I just wanted to ask while she's on it, just in case it was like, oh yeah, this happens when blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Well, nothing off the top of my head, unfortunately. Um, okay, so the next bit we have uh, is just the factoring. So again, I set echo to false because we wouldn't necessarily want the output from the success of those functions visible um, in our report. Uh, and then 
maybe what I'll do is I'll open up the report so we can look at it by back to it. I want to do that now. So open the PDF. Okay. So this is the quick stats and what that will look like. So over here we have just the syntax highlighting that we asked for, and here we have the inline code. So this is what the mean of the age column is. This is its standard deviation. And then this is the range. And the square brackets here, I just added myself. They're just regular text. Nothing fancy in terms of R is going on here. As you can see, like there's no mention of the factoring that we've done. Uh, that's because we set echo to false. So then we, uh, and then like here we have the aggregate functions we've used. So we're also not including them in our report. So then the next thing is actually visible are our tables. And so this is the rendering of three different tables. So the first one here is the uh, treatment factor versus sex factor, on uh, male and female. And then here are the treatment factor versus site. And the last is um, the sex factor versus site. So, uh, and you see that here, they automatically set the row labels and the column labels for you. They'll center it and they'll add this caption. And that's all part of these three lines of code. So the caption is just another argument to uh, our table call over here. And the thing to note with a lot of these uh, knit R functions that you use is that they'll generally only render when you actually press knit. So when you have to use one of these functions, you can't really press um, like this display button to run the code independently because they'll give you all kinds of errors that are generally purely hard to um, resolve otherwise and don't have a resolution in this environment because it, it depends on a lot of other factors in the background. Okay, so the next bit that we have uh, is this uh, sub, 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 subheading that I've included, so four levels of the chi-square test that we want to run. And each subheading becomes like progressively smaller, so then it, it takes up less space and then it also just um, allows you to kind of create a flow within your readings. And then just to jump back, because we set our table of contents to only two levels, all you'll see in the table of contents uh, are the uh, point ones or point twos, and not the ones that are further down. So we can actually set the table of contents here to a depth of, let's say, uh, five, and knit it again. And So this is what the uh, HTML will look like. You'll see that in the case of, hold up, I'm just going back to the PDF. I don't mean to do that. Um, why that didn't. Okay, I will take a look at it later. Just in the interest of time, but what should happen is you should see additional levels to your subheadings within these here, and they also come automatically linked to the appropriate spot in your actual PDF file. Okay, so where would we? Okay, so next we have our bar plots. And like I said, I split them up into two different code chunks, just that the space is um, a little bit easier to manage and they all fit nicely on one page. And that's what they look like over here. So just the same box plots that we worked with earlier with a nice little heading up here. And then the legend formatting that we've done uh, looks like this. So, I set it up as uh, a two column row, which is this portion right over here. So instead of it being uh, in a single column, which is what the default would look like, it's um, just in a single row. So it takes up less vertical space on your page. Um, and that's like a nice way to, to cram a bunch of figures on a single page if you have a tight page limit. 
on the publication. Um, then you have your um, Y limits here or just expanded a little bit to 45 rather than what used to be 40, just to allow your legend to fit into the figure. And then the figure width is set to 10 um, and the height is set to three, just so that it doesn't take up too much space and we can fit in this big figure in section three for the rest of the page. And that's just numbers that are played around with until they look nice. This is a section of code that I wanted to include. Um, again, as Fonsa said yesterday, a really good uh, case, I guess, uh, for using our markdown is to show code that is needed to make an analysis, but then like not necessarily show all the output from that code uh, because you know it might be quite lengthy or not particularly meaningful. And so um, to demonstrate that, we have the melt function. Uh, I used the tidier version, which is pivot longer, uh, just so you have the ability to see what they look like. So this is the exact same thing as what um, Lauren had done with uh, melt, which kind of breaks the different marker columns into a single column that has the marker identifier that we used to create our ggplot at the bottom here. So I silenced the output from that just by setting echo to false. Otherwise, the code is exactly the same. And then I added a caption to our figure. And that's just this section over here. So fig.cap. And then we write paste so that it uh, renders nicely as a string in knit. And that's just um, kind of the heuristic that you have to follow uh, with the string over here for what you'd want your caption to be. And you can use any of the paste functions. So for example, if you wanted to be a bit more clever about it, you can maybe use paste zero and then use a variable name from earlier on. But that's a bit. Uh, more involved. Yeah, and then as you can see here, you can set the same themes as you've set before. So this is something that, um, so if you look here, the labels are on an angle, so you can fit them nicely. Oh, I accidentally highlighted it. Um, yeah. All of you guys having all sorts of technical difficulties right now. My laptop is really not happy about running Zoom eight hours a day. Uh, okay, so you know, we're back in our box plot. Uh, we can see that our labels are on an angle, and that's something that we can control just with the same ggplot commands that we learned yesterday. So you can set the theme. You can also adjust the background and the font and the text sizes the same way that we done before. Uh, and then uh, knit will just render it uh, within a table. So the actual extent to which you can control your code is the same as you'd had before. All you'd really want to watch out for is like the spacing that you give the figure. That's one thing that's very finicky I found with our markdown. And then the last thing that I wanted to include is just the straight output of the t-test. So I find these kind of like already out of the box, nicely formatted. So you can just plop them down into a report so that um, you can kind of show people what they look like. Again, you can play around with the uh, width and height of these sections so that they don't cut off on the side over here. Then also, if you have an HTML page, that kind of already does it automatically. So if we open this in a web browser, for example, it'll look like this. Yeah, so as you can see, it's cut off a bit here. That's something you kind of have to watch out for when you do just a raw R output. Um, I'll just continue on the side over here. But you can always uh, play around with the width of that particular um, chunk to accommodate a little bit. Uh, well, or alternatively, you can also access those sections um, with just inline code, the way that we did with the mean and the standard deviation portions of this. Uh, and that's what this will look like. So as you can see, we did echo false so that you don't have to look at the code itself. You can just look at the output from the t-test. Uh, and, and that's all.